Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Victor Vafiadis, who's going to be giving our um, invited talk. So Victor is a researcher at Max Planck Institute, where, um, in uh, SWS, uh, Super Software Systems, uh, in Saarbrücken, and uh, he's been there since 2010. Um, he got his PhD in 2008 at the University of Cambridge uh, and did postdocs at Microsoft Research and, uh, um, and the University of Cambridge. Um, Victor has been doing a lot of impressive work on the semantics and verification of uh, concurrency, uh, of concurrent semantics and persistency. Um, and I've always been in awe of how he managed to ta manages to tackle all these like relaxed memory models and weak memory models, which are like I just find utterly daunting. Um, so this is an incredibly impressive line of work. Um, so Victor, um, in 2008, received the John um, Reynolds uh, Distinguished Dissertation Award uh, from SIGPLAN. Uh, for his uh, dissertation on modular fine grained concurrency verification. And this year, he is the recipient of the SIGPLAN Robin Milner Award, um, which is given by SIGPLAN to young researchers who have uh, made uh, impressive uh, advances in programming languages. So um, we will hear the full citation for the award at the business meeting, um, where Richard will receive the award. Thank you for receiving the award at Pablo. Um, really great. It's an honor. Um, so go ahead. Um, he's going to talk about uh, principles of persistent programming today. Well, thank you for your kind words. I'm very glad to be here, uh, to be give, I'm humbled to be giving a, a talk at the 50th Popple. It's even the first talk at the 50th Popple, and the first Popple talk for myself. So my general research directions that are also mentioned in the, in the research award were uh, uh, concurrent program logics, weak memory concurrency, weak persistency, model checking. And on the side, I've done some work on interactive theorem proving, mainly to support the other four lines of work, but in addition to also have uh, verified compilers in the style of ComCert. Now, I must say, before I start uh, the actual talk, so, which will be about weak persistency, uh, that this work is not done by myself on my own. Uh, as all research in our field, or almost all research, uh, is collaborative, so is mine. Uh, I went uh, up at the DBLP and found that they had 102 co-authors. Um, I would like to uh, single out four of them uh, on the slide, which contributed hugely to the main four research directions uh, that they've that took. So Matthew Parkinson was initially my de facto advisor and then also my second official advisor as a PhD student. And with him, I, I, I worked out uh, the combination of rely guarantee reasoning and separation logic that was a topic of my thesis. Then when I moved to Germany, to the Max Planck uh, Institute, I started working on weak memory. And I had as a postdoc at the time, Ori, with whom sort of more than half of my uh, papers on weak memory are co-authored. Then I got another postdoc, Azalea, and she moved me into a different direction, which I'll be talking about today. So weak persistency. And OK, I had some students, but one particular one that is also in this room, Michalis, uh, was the one that moved into yet another direction, that of uh, model checking. So I must say that, and that in all of these directions would have been impossible had they not had these collaborators, plus the many others that uh, I'm afraid I will not list here. So what is persistent programming? And why did I choose this topic as the topic of my, of my talk? First, I wanted something to contain the word principles, since we're talking about the principles of programming language. So let me talk about the principles of some specific class of programming languages, that of uh, persi persistent uh, programming ones. So what are persistent programs? They're programs that operate on data that survives the end of the program. 
So whether that end is a normal termination of the program or is an abrupt termination due to some failure. For instance, a power failure. Somebody uh, turns off the machine. There are cases where the, uh, some of the data uh, operated on by the application persists after the sort of end of the application, and you care really much about the data persisting. Let's say you write a file to the hard disk, and you want sort of after the end of the application and you turn off the machine that the file is still there and contains the right data. Often these applications, as any other application these days, is uh, concurrent, so there, there is multi-threading, there are issues due to concurrency as well. Now, what challenges uh, do we have in, in this domain? The main challenge is that of the semantics. So, any platform uh, providing some sort of persistency tends to have very weird and usually unspecified semantics. In this talk, I will focus on non-volatile memory, which I'll explain what it is in a bit, but it's a more general issue. So in a it also occurs with traditional file systems. Suppose you, write, you have a program that has opened two files. It writes some data to one file. It closes it. It writes some data to the second file. It closes it. And then there is a crash of the machine. It's quite possible that the data on the second file is written, but not the data on the first file. Even more, it's possible that some part of the data is written to the file and not the entire data. Even worse, it could be that some mixture of the garbage that was, uh, of, of the data that was before the write in the file and the data that was written uh, is present afterwards. And even worse, perhaps there is even corrupt data. So there, there are ways to work around all of these uh, limitations. The file systems in the operating system try to uh, resolve most of these uh, issues, but some others are left to the programming language level. In some work that we've done, we have found bugs in uh, concerning this saving of files in standard text editors, VI, Emacs, uh, Nano, and so on. So. You can save a file, the, the application prints, the file is saved, and then sort of you turn off the computer, turn it back on, and you see that the file is not there, or it contains different data from what you expected. Um, it's, it's not very frequent that it happens, but it can happen. So one needs specific care when programming such applications, and of course, sort of, it's not so easy to achieve uh, correctness. Um, how do you achieve correctness normally? You test the program. You run it. You see the outcome. Yes, it looks OK. Then I've, you test it many times. And then you're convinced that the application works. You cannot do that with persistency, because you have to crash the application sometime. Uh, OK, there are many ways that you could, it could crash. Ideally, you'd want to test multiple. but you have, but there is a huge cost of crashing the application, turning off the power. Yes, of course, uh, the, application, the data is supposed to survive, but you can turn off the power once or twice or a hundred times. You cannot really turn it off and on a million times without uh, ruining the hardware. And the main issue on top of these is that because the data persists after the end of the application, so does any buggy uh, data, any corruption uh, by the application. Here I have a simple cartoon that, look, I'm, right, I'm typing on my computer, and oh, I have an error. The, the data is corrupt. Uh, what, what should I do? Well, let me call IT. Hello, my machine has crashed. Ah, have you tried rebooting? Um, let me try. Oops, nothing changed. I mean, the data has persisted. Um, and so the, the standard way of uh, resolving failures doesn't quite work for these kind of, uh, uh, of programs, these kind of uh, failures. 
So let me go back now to a history of programming languages. Uh, we start with sequential programming, and that was uh, pretty straightforward. We'll, we will know how to write uh, I know, code for ENIAC or for any of the other machines. Um, OK, there are high-level programming languages that help us, but we know that. So at some point, we start having concurrency, uh, which was initially interleaving concurrency. So we have multiple threads uh, that run, in principle, on different uh, processing units. And they take turns in accessing the shared memory. So each uh, CPU, so the, whenever it, uh, the program has, uh, performs a write or read, accesses memory performing that, uh, the effect of that instruction. So here I have an example of a two-threaded program where with two shared variables, x and y, that are initially 0. The first thread writes 1 to x and then reads y. The second one writes to y and reads x and stores it into a local variable. So under an, inter an interleaving semantics, you can expect that at the end, at least one of the, the reads return the value 1. One of the threads has to start first, and then by the time that the second thread uh, executes, the right, let's say, to, to the location uh, has been uh, processed. It's in memory, so it will read the updated value. And this is pretty well understood. So as we have a system for reasoning about sequential programs, uh, whore logic, uh, there is also a system for reasoning about concurrent programs. So. In whore logic, we just have a program, a precondition, a postcondition, and some inference rules. For concurrent, uh, to, uh, to extend it to concurrent programs, I'll start with the, one of the oldest methods and the most influential one, uh, Wiki Grease, which says that uh, we t let t let's take whore logic and let's add an, an additional inference rule for parallel composition. So if you have a specification for thread 1 and for thread 2, you can put the two threads in parallel. And what do you get? Well, initially, you would have to satisfy the preconditions of both commands 1 and command 2. So P1 and P2 is the total precondition. And at the end, you'll get the post conditions of both, so the conjunction. again. But there is one side condition, and this is that the the two uh, threads, the two commands, should not be interfering. Or more, more precisely, the proof outlines uh, should not be interfering. What does that mean? So it means that whenever you do a horse-style proof for one thread, and somewhere in the middle you've used some inter intermediate assertion P, uh, sorry, some intermediate assertion R here, that assertion should be stable with respect to the effects of the other thread. So if the other thread assigns some, some value u to, to x and r contains x, you need to be sure that changing, uh, replacing sort of x by the new value u still uh, satisfies the assertion. Of course, this, this could be happening under some local assertion here, some precondition p, so you can take also p into account. So, your assertion that you want to prove stable R and the precondition of the assignment should imply the, the, the assertion after the assignment. And you have to do this for all assertions that you use in the proof. It's not very scalable. There are better techniques. But this is the basic uh, approach. So let me give you an example. So the previous program, how, sh how shall I prove that at the end, um, it cannot be the case that both read the value 0? So I'll do a horse-style proof uh, for each thread here. And the first thread, it's pretty easy. Oh, so I'll assume that initially A, the local variable, is non-zero. So after you assign 1 to x, x is non-zero, and x remains non-zero at the end. In the second thread, initially you have true. You assign 1 to y, so y is non-zero. Afterwards, sort of y is non-zero, and x is b. Now, we have to satisfy this other condition 
the stability condition of a weak agrees. Uh, so we cannot just write this, the assertion b equals x because that's not stable with, the, with respect to the assignment that x becomes 1. So you'll weaken this assertion to a is non-zero or, uh, or b is x. And if you take the conjunction of the two uh, post conditions and you do some, some logical reasoning, you can observe that either A is non-zero or B is non-zero. So uh, the, how do we check stability? Well, we have to take all the pairs. The only interesting one is this, is this one here, where there is an assignment to X, and here there is an assertion containing X. But fortunately, you see the precondition of the assignment is exactly this other uh, disjunct over there. So uh, the assertion is trivially stable. And so this completes a proof. And we're, OK, with respect to y, again, it's, uh, it's very straightforward. So um, there are many, many program logics uh, deriving from a weak agrees. Pretty much all concurrent program logics, in one way or another, derive from it. And OK, I've just shown you the simplest one, but uh, you can imagine all of the subsequent ones improving uh, uh, the basic one one way or another. So let's move on to weak memory concurrency now. So in weak memory concurrency, we have additional behaviors than the, one, uh, than the ones are, that are allowed by uh, interleaving semantics. So here I'm giving uh, an example of the TSO architecture, the, the one used by x86, to a, to, a for, to a rough approximation, and the same program that uh, we have seen before. Now, under x86 and pretty much under uh, almost every other architect uh, architecture that you can buy, it's possible to observe the weak outcome that both threads read the value 0. How is it possible on this x86 picture? It's, it's quite simple. Uh, the writes uh, do not go directly to memory from uh, the processor, but first uh, are uh, buffered in first in, first out uh, queue. So when when, uh, the, uh, let's say, the, the first thread writes x to 1, the write of x goes to the, this blue buffer over there. And, it, and at some later point, uh, uh, unspecified, it can propagate to memory. And when a thread reads, it first consults its own buffer. If it sees a corresponding entry, it returns it. Uh, if it doesn't see any entry in its buffer, it reads from memory. So now for the program that we have, it's quite possible that first the two writes execute. They end up in different buffers, and suppose they stay there for some time. Then the reads execute. Each thread consults its own buffer. It doesn't see a, a write to the same location. So it reads from memory. It reads the initial value. And so it returns 0. Besides this. Uh, operational description of weak memory, there is another description, which is called uh, axiomatic, but perhaps a better naming is declarative. So there, what, uh, what, we, what we do is so that we uh, construct execution graphs corresponding to uh, single executions of the program. So these are graphs or pictures like the one shown here that have uh, nodes corresponding to the individual memory accesses of the program, like a write that writes the value 1 to x, a read of y that returns the value 0. And these uh, events, these nodes, are connected by various edges uh, corresponding to, let's say, the order in which they appear in the program. The, these are the solid black edges, the program order. Or, let's say, the, the second type of edge, this uh, green dashed edge, which is the reads from relation, which for every 
read event, it finds a, co a, a corresponding write that writes the same value to the same location. And, okay, depending on the memory model, there might be additional ones here. There is a modification order, there are some derived relations, and so on. And now each memory model is given as a property on, uh, on the graphs, usually as some combination of relations uh, being uh, irreflexive, or a cyclic in this case, so the transitive closure being irreflexive. So sequential consistency can be defined as a union of all these four relations there being uh, acyclic, uh, sort of the TSO, uh, that the, the X86 model is, uh, is uh, sort of two reflexivity conditions, this one here and this other more complicated one. The, uh, the whole point of having uh, this uh, declarative version is that it's much more concise to write uh, the semantics of a memory model. Here in sort of half a slide, I fitted four, uh, four memory models. Whereas if I were to write the operational semantics, I would need four pages, roughly. I'm, okay, I must say also that during the years, the notation that we have been using to, to write uh, these memory models has improved a lot. So the initial descriptions of, okay, maybe not these memory models, but some others were, again, still page long, but uh, with better insight, better notation, they have been uh, condensed uh, to, to a slide. So when we have to different representations, so different models, the natural thing that we want to do as theoreticians is to prove that they're equivalent. And indeed, these two, uh, these two models, the operational one and uh, a declarative one, have been shown equivalent for a variety of models, um, in particular for the TSO that I'm talking about. It's not my work, it's work by Scott Owens mainly, uh, Mark Batty, Peter Sewell, and... Uh, um, and others, but there are also dif additional definitions of memory models that have been shown uh, equivalent to the ones above. So there is a definition of TSO that is based on program transformations. If you take, if you allow certain compiler op optimizations that reorder certain commands in your program, uh, in particular a write. Uh, followed by a read, uh, you can show that sort of these reorderings plus uh, sequential consistency is the same as TSO. Uh, this sadly works almost exclusively for TSO and, for not, and not for any other interesting memory models. Um, there is also an operational model that doesn't use store buffers, as I've, as I've shown here, but uses load buffers. The idea that uh, a thread can prefetch at any time from memory, can put it in a buffer, and when it actually reads, it reads the most recent uh, entry from the prefetch buffer. And then when it writes, it writes directly to memory, overwriting any entries in the prefetch buffer. And okay, that has also been uh, shown equivalent to these other two uh, models. So let's now go on further to sort of more recent times where we have a weak memory persistency. So the traditional computer storage uh, structure is that you have memory and you have hard disks. Memory is fast, but it's volatile. It loses its contents when you turn the machine off. Hard disks are slow. They provide block size access as opposed to byte size access, but they preserve their contents. So it gives you durable storage. So if you have a transaction of some financial data or something that you really care about uh, it being recorded and surviving a crash, you have to write it to disk. You have to wait a long time for the write to complete. Well, the, and okay, the software really reflects this uh, hardware structure. We use 
plain pointers and, and to write to memory normal variables, but we use file systems and OS system calls to write uh, to disk. Now there is non-volatile memory. Uh, this is uh, this picture is the uh, from the Intel's Optane uh, memory chip that was produced recently and also discontinued recently. Um, and what it provides, it provides the benefits of both. So it's a bit slower than RAM, but much faster than hard disks. It provides uh, storage that is durable, sort of preserves uh, the failure of the machine. It, it has much larger capacity than, than normal memory, and it's more energy efficient. And this technology, along with similar technologies that exist, uh, allow us to rethink how we structure uh, our applications, specifically how we organize our data. We do not necessarily need to have this separation between data on disk, so this file system interface, and data that is accessed quickly uh, through memory, because anyway, the access time of, uh, of this slightly slower memory is not that much lower. So let me just give you now an, an outline of what I will be talking in the future. So I'll, I'll, de I'll describe a bit the semantics of these applications. How can we ensure that the semantics correspond to what hardware does? How can we uh, define when an algorithm is correct and how can we check uh, for correctness. So first, what semantics can a programmer have? Let's start with a very simple program. You write to X, you write to Y. It's a sequential program, the simplest one you can imagine. Okay, with two instructions, I guess. Um, so, and at the end, uh, there is a crash. So what can happen? Well, you can certainly expect the outcome that X and Y are, have persisted when you reboot your machine. But it's possible that all of the other outcomes can also appear. So in particular, let's say the second outcome and the third one uh, occurs because, a cra so because it takes time for data to persist. An execution of the program proceeds ahead of persistence. So it takes time to write to memory. If the first the data goes into the cache, at some point it's evicted and it goes to memory. The, pro the processor doesn't wait until uh, it receives an acknowledgement from the memory. So, uh, and it continues executing. So it's quite possible that the program has finished and yet nothing is in, me in persistent memory. So the second thing that can happen though is that writes can persist out of order. So, as I said, they first go into the cache, and the entries are eventually evicted from the cache. Now, they are evicted, usually, not in the order in which they are inserted into the cache, but rather in this weird order in which uh, the cache lines are decided to be evicted because of conflicts, because of another uh, application or maybe the same application wanting to use uh, a different uh, a different address that happens to uh, to fall on the on the same uh, cache domain whatever so it will evict the old uh, line in order to to have space to put the new one so and and as an effect, because, I mean, again, in typical s systems with, uh, with uh, persistency, caches are not persistent, but only the uh, non-volatile memory is, then we can get th these outcomes. So what do we need? We need uh, a semantics for non-volatile memory, and there are two components of it. There's a consistency model talking about the semantics of multiple threads, and uh, the persistency model, which is about the order in which uh, 
operations persist to memory. And NVM semantics is a combination of the two. So let me now explain a basic persistency model. So as with uh, uh, the model I showed for TSO in terms of weak memory, there is some buffering going on. So uh, what, when a processor uh, writes, it adds uh, a corresponding entry to its persistence buffer. And then that entry at some later point in time, it gets propagated to uh, persistent memory. When, uh, when a thread reads, here, you get, uh, you get the value from the persistence buffer if there is any entry there. If not, you get the value from memory, the same as before. And upon a crash, you lose this persistence buffer, which is supposed to represent the cache, but you preserve the, the persistent memory. Uh, this buffer is not a uh, first-in, first-out buffer. Uh, operations there, so the requests to write to memory, uh, can be reordered. So this explains how you can get this out-of-order persists, as well as the, the other uh, weak behaviors. So suppose we want to... Uh, to eliminate this behavior. How can we rewrite the program so as to eliminate this, um, this out of order uh, persistence? So the, the, ideally, we would want to put some instruction between the two, which acts like a barrier, which says, let me try to persist the right to x. I mean, you may want to have a, a, a full fence that persists everything, but that's quite expensive, so it will have to flush the entire cache. Uh, so it, typically, you'd have persist of a specific cache line. So if you use this instruction under a strong semantics that says that it would block until uh, the data is persisted, uh, then you would, it would eliminate the fourth outcome, but also the second one. Now, let's look at what hardware provides. It doesn't provide one such instruction, but uh, three. At least x86 provides three. Uh, cache line write back, cache line flash optimize, and cache line flash that have uh, slightly different semantics, and they have slightly different performance. So in terms of the semantics that is observed to the user application, write back and flash opt are, are the same, and whereas flash is stronger, it provides a bit more ordering. And in terms of performance, they are sort of ordered in that suggestive fashion, um, in that sort of right back um, waits for the data to be, uh, to be sent to memory, but does not remove it from the cache. So if you access it again later, it will still be in the cache, whereas uh, flash and flash opt also remove it from the cache. And uh, flash opt and write back are a bit weakly ordered with respect to subsequent instructions, whereas flash really sort of waits until, before it executes any subsequent instruction. So that's, uh, so if you use uh, this flash, you will get uh, the expected behavior. If you use one of these other instructions, the, the flash opt or the write back, you will not get anything. You will get all, fos all four uh, possibilities. Why is that? Because these instructions tell the hardware to flash that, uh, that cache line, but do not wait for the flash to complete. Why might you want that instruction? Well, maybe you want to flash multiple cache lines and at the end wait for them all to complete. And it's possible to do that. Uh, you can add another special fence after that instruction that will wait for the, for the write back to complete. And then the combination of the two instructions uh, uh, gives you the, the expected semantics. 
So here it is uh, on the page. So if you use a store fence or a memory fence or a read, modify, write instruction in combination with a flush opt, then you get essentially the same semantics as flush. So that was the persistency semantics. Now there is also the weak memory consistency semantics which of this, uh, t the TSO machine I showed before, and we have to combine them. So we have uh, blue buffers, we have green buffers. What do we do? Well, we put them together. We put two layers of buffers. Um, and that's, uh, we believe that that's what the machine does. And we have some evidence to show that, um, uh, which I'll get to. So there is, um, there is this layer of buffering due to consistency. Uh, so each uh, processor, each thread, has its own uh, local buffer. And then there is this global one, uh, and at the end there is memory. So as for uh, weak memory, we have two models, the operational one and an axiomatic one that we show our equivalent. So that's about the semantics. Can we ensure that the semantics corresponds uh, to what the hardware does? Let's test the hardware. So we'll use a technique uh, common in weak memory. We take litmus tests. These are small programs, like the, like the, ones, uh, I, sh like the one I showed, uh, with two or three threads, two or three instructions per thread, that are designed to exhibit some uh, odd behavior. You run the program many times on the hardware, you check if the weak behavior was ever uh, observed. Now with weak memory, it's fairly simple. You just uh, use commodity hardware and so on. With persistency, it's not quite so easy because you can, as I said, you cannot crash and uh, the machine all the time. So what we did instead was to use some specialized hardware to observe the, the traffic on the memory bus. So what is this? So sort of between sort of the CPU and the caches, which are in one chip, and the memory, whether volatile or non-volatile, which is on a different part of the motherboard, there is this memory bus, and sort of in between you place a probe, and you sort of connect that probe with a monitor that records the traffic. And then you have to do a lot of work to sort of be able to run the, 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 the programs on that machine, to be able to find which addresses the program's uh, access, because I mean, normally you write, there is a virtual to physical uh, uh, translation done by the, uh, the, the OS, but in, in addition, there is a physical address to sort of memory address done by the hardware. So what you observe on the memory bus is not at all correlated uh, to the, the address that you have uh, in the source program. So you have to uh, do some work to, to, to establish this correlation. And then you run the program, you collect many traces, and you see if uh, the behaviors uh, provided by the semantics are the ones that uh, are, sort of agree with what the, the behaviors uh, have been observed. And we did that for two architectures, uh, the Intel uh, x86 and for one ARM implementation. And in both cases, we observed some discrepancies. Uh, in particular, for Intel, we observed the case where you issue uh, a write to X, a strong, uh, the strongest flash possible with maybe extra fences just for, uh, for, for, uh, for additional confidence, and then a write to Y, many fla uh, flashes and fences, uh, all done in a loop, uh, sort of a million times, whatever, and we record the trace, and occasionally we see in the trace two adjacent accesses to X, or two adjacent accesses to Y, which suggests that there is something fishy going on. Uh, what we have been told by Intel is that in the CPU and cache chip, there is also this memory controller that also has a buffer, and that uh, that buffer happens to also reorder some entries there. 
but there is uh, enough capacitance in the chip that if there is a crash, then there is enough capacitance for that buffer to be flushed. Uh, so at the end, you're not supposed to ever observe in reality uh, a weak behavior. This is completely untestable. Uh, we, we can trust, I suppose, the manufacturer, uh, but I find it unfortunate that this is not documented and there is no way of independently uh, validating the claim. Now, having that experience, we tried with ARM. Uh, we talked first with ARM engineers to find out, uh, to ensure that there is no similar buffer in their implementation. They gave us some implementation where they thought that that, that, that was the case. And we tested it there. There we observed some other weird behaviors. Uh, sometimes the writes being lost or writes being duplicated. We do not know quite why that's, what that is happening. We've asked uh, the manufacturer and we're waiting for the response. So how can we validate hardware? Well, so and so. Uh, now, let, let's move on to correctness. When is a persistent algorithm correct? I'll, I'll just talk about persistent serializability, which is one correctness notion mainly for transactions, uh, similar notions can be given for, uh, for algorithms. So serializability, I guess you all know, you have a set of transactions, they are serializable if their outcome is the same as them appearing in some sequential order. Uh, with persistent serializability, we additionally want that upon a crash, some prefix of that order is persisted. So, for instance, let's, in this order where T1 uh, executed before T2, maybe the crash happened at the very beginning or in the middle or at the end. And everything sort of, sort of before the crash or a prefix of it should have persisted. So, so there is a crash, some prefix of the order sort of before the crash is persisted and everything else is not. Generally, you have you can have a program that crashes multiple times. So that after each crash, there is some recovery phase, and then the program continues executing, there is another crash, and so on. And this persistent serializability gives you a fairly strong uh, uh, guarantees that overall there would be a reasonable execution uh, of the program. Now we have to validate whether uh, our definition is uh, feasible, whether you can write programs like that and whether it's useful. So it's feasible, we've uh, shown it by, uh, by designing some very simple uh, transactional implementations that satisfy uh, uh, this uh, persistent serializability definition over the underlying persistent mod persistency models of the architectures. So x86 and r. So is it useful? Well, this, the simplest thing that we could imagine and we did is we show that take any, any sequential program, any library of, um, sort of, of a data structure that has some reasonable sequential semantics like a queue, and take each of the operations and wrap it within a transaction block. And then what you get is directly a persistently serializable uh, implementation, so, that it, so a correct one under uh, concurrency and persistency. So that's a brief digression about transactions. Uh, you, there is also a notion of persistent or durable linearizability, which is for concurrent algorithms. And now I would like to sort of talk about how we can establish those notions. Or more simply, even how can we establish an invariant about a persistent program. One possibility is to use a program logic, like uh, an extension of a weak grease. So the idea is to, uh, in this line of work, this persistent or weak grease, is to model the program that contains uh, flashes as a program over a, vi a bigger variable domain that does not contain any uh, awkward instructions, and then reason about that 
transform program under normal Lewicki Grease reasoning. So what do we do? We insert, we, for each variable x of the program, we'll have two variables, the volatile version and the persistent version of it. And we will always consider the, the program being verified under a context, so under a parallel thread, let's see, that can copy over uh, data from the volatile uh, to the persistent, modeling the fact that the buffer can be flushed at any point. Now, how do we model the, the instructions of the program? Just assignments are, are pretty straightforward. You just write to the volatile. And flushes, so the flushes force uh, this, uh, mo uh, this move from, of the data from volatile to uh, persistent. So x persisted, it becomes x volatile. Now you have a program. You can reason about it sort of using standard techniques. If you want to take uh, account of weak memory, you cannot use uh, the standard of wiki grease because, as, as I've shown, that's, that is unsound under weak memory. But you can use some variant of it that is sound. And the other approach is model checking. So this is an approach that is not um, so typical at Popol. Uh, in that we sort of tend, we, we usually like to do manual proof and spend effort trying to understand why a program is correct. But, you know, if the program is small, uh, the machine can just try out all the possible executions of the program and say, yes, the assertion holds. Uh, don't spend any time trying to understand why it works. So what is uh, software model checking? We have a program P and a property phi. We want to check that all the executions of the program satisfy the property. And it's a very naive strategy. Just enumerate all the executions. And for each execution you enumerate, check that the property holds. Uh, of course, programs have to be finite. They have to be have a small number of executions for this to ever scale. The first question is, how do you represent executions? Executions following the operational semantics or following a declarative semantics? I mean, there are obvious, there are obvious benefits. So that we're much more used to operational semantics. We can build an interpreter. But sort of the structure of the model the number of buffers and where they are and how messages move around and so on are very model specific. So if you have a model for TSO and a model for ARM, you'd need rather different interpreters. For declarative, okay, it might not be so immediate how do you execute a declarative semantics, but it has some other more important benefits in that it's largely model agnostic. The only thing that changes from one model to another is this condition as to when a graph is consistent. And in its representation, it has very little redundancy. So just to give you an example, here is a simple program with three threads. The first writing to x and reading x, the second one doing the same with y, and the third one uh, with z. So the, the only reasonable outcome of this program is at the end x and y and z have the value 1 and a, b, c have the value 1. So if you consider just the interleavings of this program under an operational semantics, let alone the buffers and so on, you get 19 interleavings. And as I make my program a bit larger, this uh, number blows up. If you consider the execution graph, there is precisely one execution graph corresponding to these 19 interleavings. Uh, the one shown over there, where the read events get their value, so this, this, this dashed edge from the corresponding right. So uh, it really makes sense uh, to use declarative models. Uh, here is a comparison between a tool that uses an operational approach and a tool that uses a declarative approach for some weak memory benchmarks. Uh, and you can see the difference in speed. So how do we 
and do modern checking, therefore, with graphs. We are supposed to construct all execution graphs of the program, so we'll construct them incrementally. We'll fix some insertion order, and we'll add events one at a time. So here is a simple program, two threads, a write and a read. We start with initialization event, uh, x is 0 at the beginning. We'll add, let's say, the, fir the first thread, x, uh, uh, a write of x. And now we'll have to add the read. When you add the read, you have to consider all possibilities where it can read from. It could either read from the initial write, leading to this graph, or from the first thread, leading to that graph. The, these are two graphs that you would explore further adding subsequent threads. Now, just for illustration purposes, suppose I add the read before the write. So when I add it, there's only one possibility. It can read from the initial write. And so when I later go and add the write, I have to consider the case that the already existing read in the graph reads uh, from the newly added write. So I'll have to revisit this read uh, to consider the case that it reads from the write over here. So there are um, various algorithms that, uh, that do this very efficiently, and uh, you can read a sequence of papers if you're interested in it. How do we check now persistency assertions, which, are, uh, which is uh, the topic uh, that I want to talk about? So we have a program, and suppose we want to check that y at the end is, uh, doesn't have the value 1. You know, pre pretty trivial. A simple approach is to enumerate all the post-crash states. That's a huge number, so we, we should not do that. Uh, even with, uh, with certain optimizations that you do not record all the orderings, it's still a large number. Uh, and in particular, so the, uh, the assertion about why uh, doesn't really, uh, is not dependent on the x and the z uh, uh, components, whether they persist or not. So uh, a, a better approach is to consider this uh, persistency assertion as another thread in parallel to the main program that just reads y and asserts uh, a content. So with this, uh, then you have just two execution graphs uh, of this program, one where y reads the initial value 0 and one where it reads 2. And in both cases, uh, the assertion holds. And you can, you can imagine, as you make the programs uh, larger, this approach uh, scales much, much better uh, than the previous ones. So as in summary, I have shown uh, sort of an overview of uh, how programming languages can help this domain of uh, we, uh, weak persistency, specifically non-volatile memory. Uh, I have covered, I think, a wide range of uh, PL features in my talk. Uh, one thing that I would like to say uh, and conclude is uh, go back to this point that, uh, I, uh, that Intel discontinued Obtain. So uh, a question about the future of this uh, line of work. So Intel, as I said, has discontinued the production of uh, these Optane non-volatile memory chips because it didn't make as much profit as they had anticipated and sold that part of the company to some, some other. It still continues to support other NVM uh, projects, but it's not producing the chips themselves. So, it's certainly, uh, sort of, let's say, bad for us in that uh, we've lost some motivation saying, ah, look, Intel supports it. But uh, it's, it's a domain that will not go away. So persistent programming is, is interesting in its own regard. There, it has enough benefits that it will catch up, it just, but perhaps Intel will not be one of the main players anymore. Uh, as for us as academia, I think our research can be motivated but should not be guided by what one company decided for reasons that have nothing to do or have very little to do 
with the scientific merits of an approach. We investigate the principles of persistent programming, and these are relevant even if non-volatile memory doesn't catch on. As I said, file systems have almost the same problems as non-volatile memory, just at a different level. With that, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. So happy to take questions in the room. And uh, for those of you who are watching virtually, um, you can submit questions on Aramid. Yes. Thank you. Victor, lovely work as always. Uh, it's great to see like all this stuff summarized. It's very impressive. Um, you've been involved with, I suppose, sort of three different domains with kind of like weird semantics, I suppose. So like I think of um, relaxed memory and distributed systems and now and now this work. Do you think there's kind of a playbook now for how people should deal with these kind of weird semantics? So when someone comes along with kind of the new, whatever the next thing is, is there a way that we can kind of get ahead of it rather than, I feel like so often we're playing, as a community, we're playing catch up. Um, someone does something weird and then we're like, oh, what do we do about it? Is there, are we getting towards a world where we could kind of come up with some better principles for these kinds of weird semantics based on the work that you've been doing? Yes, thank you for the question, Mike. Indeed. So, as programming language people, we have, uh, we have all the tools at hand. And the main tool is that, or the main two tools, is that we can understand formal definitions and we can do proofs. And these are the two important uh, tools that we can use to design uh, good semantics. So, how do you use proofs? Well, okay, understanding definitions and trying to make definitions compact and readable and understandable, that's an important part of it. But also doing proofs is, an, I would say, an even more important part of the picture because first we try to design, have two or three different uh, styles of semantics and relate them. One might appear more natural uh, to the um, sort of to, let's say to the developers of the hardware, one might be more convenient for model checking, let's say, but the equivalence proof will will tell us whether the semantics is completely ad hoc or has some some good structure to it. It might be quite some work to do this proof. Uh, and I would start first by developing an axiomatic semantics, which is more concise, and then trying to, to relate it to an operational one. But that gives us a sort of uh, gives us something that cannot be achieved yet, at least by uh, by standard industry. Uh, and the second kind of proof we can do, and it's really important is to prove properties of the semantics. So the whole purpose of all of these weird behaviors is to enable some uh, optimizations, whether in the compiler or in the hardware. So um, it's, it's good to be able to show that these optimizations are correct. And we can we do not need to show that the code implementing the optimization is correct. It suffices to show that the general pattern, that reordering two instructions, is something admitted by the model. This is a proof that can be done fairly easily at the axiomatic level, uh, as uh, my co-author Michalis will show in the next uh, session. This can be done automatically for a large class of memory models. So this is. Uh, a starting point that any, uh, any new development should try to use these tools that can just check uh, whether simple uh, properties of, uh, of the semantics hold.
Um, are there any works towards the proving and specifying the hyper properties of this type of durable systems? Uh, sorry, I, can, uh, I cannot hear you very well. Um, is it better? Um, are there any works that focuses on uh, specifying and proving the hyper properties of this type of durable systems that is on the like a program logic, logic level or uh, a more axiomatic type? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by, by these hybrid properties. Yeah, like, uh, a, like a liveness property or okay. like security properties. Okay, okay, okay. Um, not yet. I mean, there is there is one work uh, or uh, two works actually uh, on the weak memory uh, uh, that try uh, that establish some simple liveness properties. For most part, uh, this sort of my line of work and pretty much everything else in the literature is uh, focused on safety properties. Um, uh. Could these techniques be used on systems without persistent memory to uh, reason about volatile memory? So, for example, if you had direct memory access and, you know, some other device on the bus is listening to these addresses and you want to reason about which values that device could see? Uh, very much so, yes. So, one... Uh, one paper we even had uh, was to uh, to give semantics to ad additional instructions or additional access modes provided by Intel, let's say like these non-temporal stores or allocating um, uh, pages that bypass the cache. Uh, so these have very awkward semantics and some of that semantics is relevant for persistent programming, but it's also relevant for the applications you mentioned. We'll take one more question, and I just want to say, if you could just say your name and your um, affiliation um, before you ask, that would be great. Hi, um, I'm Robert Krabos, Rodot University of Nijmegen. Um, thanks for the great talk. So you had quite some interactions with Intel and with ARM uh, in this work. What was your experience with that? Uh, uh, how did you get such uh, uh, interactions to start? How long did it take it before they took you seriously, maybe, if that was a problem and so on? Well, it, it takes a long time. It's through personal connections that you know somebody that knows somebody else, somebody else. And at the end, you find the, the right architect uh, in the company to talk to, and, and <laughs> you send them a request, and at some time later, maybe instantaneously, maybe uh, a few months later, they reply.